Thanks for being with us today. My name is Darren. I'm one of the pastors here, and welcome to Friesland First Reformed Church. We are in the second week of our Advent series, God With Us. Last week, Pastor Rob started us off by speaking through a window of exaltation, and he, we were specifically looking at the angels. And last week, we lit the candle of hope. Today, we relight the candle of hope. Let this candle remind us of the great hope we have in Christ the Messiah and in God's promises. As we light the candle of peace, let us remember the birth of the Prince of Peace. Let us remember our need for a Savior to save us from our sins and give us peace with God. In Isaiah 9, 6 through 7, it says this, For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Would you please join me in a prayer, a unison prayer, as we pray to God. Gracious God, grant that we may find peace as we prepare for our Lord's birth. May divisions in ourselves and in our families be peacefully resolved. May there be peace in our cities and in the countries of our world. Help us to see the paths of peace in our lives and then give us the courage to follow them. Lord, let us remember that you only are the giver of lasting peace and that you are always with us. Amen. For our second week in our Advent series, we're going to be taking a look at the window of wonder. And we're specifically going to be taking a look at the person of Mary and how she is going to be a great example for us to follow as we follow Jesus, especially in this time leading up to his birth that we celebrate. First, I want to ask you this. It, on the screen, you'll see that there is a giant house. Have you ever gone through some neighborhoods that have like these old Victorian houses that maybe and you're going through in dusk or evening and the lights are on and there's this warm glow on the inside and the shades are up and, and you get a glimpse on the inside of the house? I know going down to Lake Geneva area here in Wisconsin, there's a ton of old houses by the lake, and, and there's a walking path that you get to walk on. You can actually walk around the lake, supposedly. I've never done it, but there's all these old houses, and you can see in the windows. And the really cool thing is when I get a peek in the windows, you, you maybe get in a peek into the living room or the sitting room or, or maybe the kitchen, and, and it's amazing, at least from what I've seen. And it brings me to this sense of wonder. I wonder, what, what is it like to live in a house like that? Because sometimes you look, and the furniture is old Victorian furniture, and it is literally set to just that type of house. And you think back to a TV show or something you've seen on TV or maybe somewhere else that you've experienced. What would it be like? It would be so cool. But maybe some of you look in that window and go, man, that seems like a lot of cleaning. Man, that seems like a lot of upkeep. I could never live in a house that big because I feel like I'd have to clean every second of every day. Do you see the difference? Looking into a house and wonder versus, well, some other way. The definition of wonder says it's a feeling of surprise mingled with admiration caused by something beautiful, unexpected, unfamiliar, or inexplicable. When you're riding around, especially this time of Christmas, when you see the lights on the houses, does that fill you with wonder? That awe? That admiration? Not covetedness where you're like, I wish I could have that because I, I want that. But wonder, wow, that's beautiful. It is so cool. Well, we're going to take a look at Mary today. And if you'd open your scriptures with me to Luke 1, 26 through 56, it's a, it's a long piece of scripture, but it's really good for us to dig into. Would you please open up 
And we're going to start reading in verse 26. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered, what kind of greeting might this be? But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will have no end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin. I don't know if she said it like that, but that's how I feel like she said it. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One will be born, will be born, will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age and she was said to be barren in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judah where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that another mother, uh, the, the mother of my Lord, should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. And in my Bible, the heading in this next section is Mary's song or Mary's praise. And Mary said, My soul praises the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. His holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their innermost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever. Even as he said to our fathers, Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. It's amazing. And we're going to dig into why each little section is amazing in a moment. But I just want to remind you, Mary responded in wonder. But she didn't necessarily respond in not grounded in reality. In Luke 1.34, she says, after being told that she's going to give birth and what's going to happen, she says, okay, uh, how's this going to happen? I'm a virgin. Kind of, you know, I know the birds and the bees. And then... The angel not only tells her kind of how it's going to happen, the Holy Spirit will come on you, you will be overshadowed. But he doesn't just stop there and tell her what's going to happen. He proves God's amazingness, how God's going to do this. He doesn't just tell her how he tells her, gives her an example of what has already happened, how God has done that. Did you catch that? This isn't just a throwaway like he's telling gossip to Mary. Hey, did you know your cousin Elizabeth, she's pregnant? There's a reason why Gabriel tells Mary this. 
to not only tell her what's going to happen, but give her proof of how the Holy Spirit through God has done it in the past. And not some distant past. It is recent past. So Mary would be, yeah, I know, Elizabeth, she was barren. She's old. She couldn't have kids. But yeah, you're right. She's pregnant. And you're telling me that's the Holy Spirit that did that? that that's what's going to happen to me? In 37, he, in verse 37, he says, for nothing is impossible with God. He doesn't just tell her what. He gives her real truth and proof. And then her response after not just kind of, you know, responding in hope and optimism, and it's grounded in reality. She says, behold, I am the Lord's bondservant. May it be done to me according to your word. Right after reason, how's this going to happen? She responds in wonder and submission. Yeah, I, I see how you've done it. I, totally, I'm in. Let's go. Mary responds in praise. Did you catch that? In Luke 1, 46 through 55, that's her song after she meets with Elizabeth. She says, my soul praises the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he has been mindful of his humble state of his servant. Catch that? She's saying that, hey, I'm not out to get fame and fortune. I was just trying to be a good person. Humility. I'm not trying to be some glory star here. I'm just living life. He chose me. My soul glorifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he is mindful of his servant. Mary was full of wonder. She was in awe that God would choose her. Where do you need to look at, God? or in a circumstance or situation that you're in and maybe respond in praise and wonder because she could have looked at this very differently right she could have looked through different windows instead of wonder she could have looked at yeah, I'm unwed, and if I get pregnant before we're going to get married, uh, do you understand the scandal that's going to happen? She doesn't say that. She doesn't say, hey, my wedding, I have this all planned out. I'm not going to fit my dress. You're killing me here, Gabriel. Like, I have this plan. Do you not understand? I have this list, and... and in my wedding, I was going to do roses and, and all this, walk down the aisle of the church. And how is that going to happen? I had a ton of bridesmaids. They've already ordered their dresses. But she responds and says, my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of his, the humble state of his servant." But so many times when God brings us to a circumstance or, or a situation, we don't respond in wonder. We respond with the what ifs, the cynicism, and stubbornness of our own plans. See, stubbornness is just this tunnel vision of our personal will. You've probably experienced this in your own life. I know I have. Where God maybe not reveals it to me, but brings me to a situation that I don't necessarily want to be in because I have this plan of where I'm going. And instead of responding in wonder 
Yes, thank you that you've been mindful of your humble servant. I say, no. Nope, I got a plan. That's not going to happen. How many times have you done that? I've done more times than I care to admit. But stubbornness, if we really are honest, it never gets us to what we really desire. How different would the story been different if Mary would not have been flexible and rolled with what God had brought her to? Mary's a good example, but Jesus is the ultimate example for us. And it brings me back to a really hard situation. So Jesus had the Last Supper with his friends, his disciples, and he's bringing a few of them to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray because he knows the time is about to happen of the hardest situation he's about to go into. And he brings up and he says, hey guys, stay here, wait, keep watch. I'm going to go a little further and pray. And he goes up a little further up the mountain and prays. And in Matthew 26, 39, he says, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. After praying, he comes back down. And again, he had told his followers to keep watch. And he comes back down and finds them sleeping. He wakes them up. He says, come on, guys. Maybe not like that, but th that's how I would have done it. Come on, guys. Get up. I told you to keep watch. They get up. I'm sure they're all sleepy-eyed. Oh, yeah, yeah, we got it, Jesus. We got it. He heads back up to pray some more. And it says, he went away the second time and prayed, my father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. And if you know the passage, he comes back down. The guys have fallen asleep again. He wakes them up, says, keep watch. He goes back up. And Matthew 26, 44 says, So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. God, if, please take this from me. If it's possible, if this is, there's any other route, please take it. But you know what? I'll do what you want me to. Because I know it's the best way. Jesus it's the ultimate example of that. We all know what happened next. Wouldn't it have been great if God would have said after that prayer, you know what, Jesus? Yeah, there is another way. We're going to hold a bake sale. Maybe a soup supper. That'll help. That, that'll do it. He knew the only way to save humanity to bring that relationship that had been severed by Adam and Eve back to a place of right relationships was through the death and resurrection of his son, the perfect sacrifice. So one day he would be the perfect victor. Through that hard thing that Jesus went, he actually achieved victory. But so many times we are stubborn of the hard thing that we are going to go into. That Again, notice Jesus asked, take this away from me, please. Right? So if some, something comes down the pipe in your life that is hard and terrible, you have every right and you have every desire to pray, God, take this from me. Jesus did it. We can too. But don't stop there and get stubborn. Because if God allows it, there's a purpose through it. He doesn't cause sin, but he can redeem it. Again, if we can get out of it, great. 
God taking you through a hard season right now? He may be setting up to bring glory to himself. Because when stubbornness happens over and over again, it never ends well. In Scripture, it's proven again and again. In Jeremiah 26, 25 through 26, the prophet Jeremiah comes down and he's speaking for God. And he says, from the time your ancestors left Egypt until now, day after day, again and again, I sent my servants to the prophets. Or sent the, my servants to prophets. But they did not listen to me or pay attention. They were stiff-necked and did more evil than their ancestors. I don't like this, the way you're calling me to live, so I'm going to do what feels right to me, and then I'm just going to complain when it doesn't go my way. There's so much in this book that in my natural self that I want to rebel against and do my own thing. God says time and time again, and he's proven it again and again. And, and our world proves it again and again. When we're disobedient to God and what he has for us, we are the ultimate losers in that because it's harder for us. So my question for us is, are you walking with God? Are you in step reading his word? Are you obeying his commands? Because these commands are not burdensome to, to tax us. They are to free us from the life of sin. Are you inclining your ear to him? Do you listen to his voice? Or have you... Stop listening because you don't like what he has to say. I was there for years. Stop listening. And it wasn't until a place where I had the hardest things in my life, mainly brought on by my own doing, that he was kind to me and whispered, are you ready now? I'm going to admit, it was hard walking through that season. But I see in my own life, and he's proven to myself and through others, that he is faithful when we are obedient. Where do you need to give up your window of stubbornness and start looking through a window of wonder of who Jesus is and what he has for you? The twin to stubbornness that kind of is the opposite of wonder is cynicism. Cynicism is just as doubtful as to whether something will happen or whether it's even worthwhile or it's trustworthy. Mary very well could have been a cynic. Yeah, I had heard about someone else trying to follow you and um, yeah, that, that ended up bad. I, I don't know if that's going to work out. I'm, I'm out. See, even in our own world that's even not believing in God, they, they understand that cynicism is not good. I was doing some research of uh, why cynicism is bad and what does it look like even outside of the church. And one business online magazine from Quartz, Quartz at Work, they had an article that said, The Secret to Dealing with Cynics at Work. That's the title of the article. And they said, Cynicism and disrespect fuel each other. See, they found in a study that when people feel disrespected, they become cynical. When they don't feel valued, they become cynical. When a boss overlooks them for a, a, a promotion or, or promises them a promotion and then pulls it back at the last minute, they feel disrespected, and then they become a cynic. Oh, we'll get you next year. Yeah, no, I, I'm totally out. And here's what they found, that when people are disrespected, they become cynical, and then when they're cynical, they, they actually show disrespect to others, and it, and it starts doing this self-fulfilling prophecy, this wheel of disrespect and cynicism. 
So what the cynic is desiring is actually by his cynical or her cynical actions is fulfilling the opposite of what they're trying to get away from. The study has shown that cynics are more likely to be conflict-prone and short-tempered and less likely to offer support to others. And when they do that, it makes others trust them less, and then they feel more disrespected, which brings them to another round of cynical disrespect and problem and conflict-prone. And here's the top of that. Another study found that not only do cynics suffer from worse physical and mental health, but a 2016 study found that cynics tend to make less money too. This is from a business article, not even scripture. They understand cynicism is not good. The very thing that the people who are cynics are trying to get, trying to get more money, more, more influence, better physical and mental health, they're actually giving themselves the opposite. How much more so in our spiritual realm? Cynicism and stubbornness, while we believe when we're in it, will get us what we want, it will get us the exact opposite. See, what we're all desiring and what we are celebrating today in Advent is peace. That Jesus is the wonderful counselor, prince of peace. And the very thing that we desire when we go through cynicism and stubbornness bring the exact opposite. See, the world around us, our culture believes that if the situation just gets to a place where everything is, doesn't have any conflict or anything like that, we will have peace. I'll have peace when X, Y, Z line up. But the opposite is true. You can have peace without having peace in your situation. Jesus says this in John 16, 32 through 33. Listen to this. A time is coming and in fact has come when you will be scattered, each of you to your home. You will leave me all alone, yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. And I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. What Jesus is saying here is your situation will not bring you peace. Because here's the deal. It's going to get bad. It's about to get really bad. But in me, you may have peace. Stubbornness and cynicism will not get us the peace that we desire. Where do you need more wonder? Like Mary. Where do you need to repent or turn or get away from being a cynic? See, biblical peace, like I just stated, is not a situation but a person named Jesus. In another place of Scripture, in two separate places, there's this account, and I believe they're two separate accounts, and I believe that's for a reason that Jesus and his disciples are crossing the sea, and as they're crossing, a great storm comes up, and the disciples are flipping out. They believe they're going to die. Their situation is harrowing. And Jesus is sleeping. I, I can see the disciples, they're bailing water, they're, they're, they're all going, what are we going to do, what are we going to do? And they are going nuts. Finally, they get to Jesus. Wake up, wake up. Do you not care if we're going to die? He gets up, calms the wind and the waves and the storm, and they all look at him, the first account of this, and they say, who is this guy that even the wind and the waves obey him? 
Further down, same account happening, same thing happening with the disciples. And Jesus again is asleep. Again, they wake him up. Jesus, Jesus, don't you understand? We're about to die. He does the same thing. But their response this time is different. They're not saying, who is this guy? The response is, surely this is the Son of God. Who you believe Jesus is, is the game changer. It can be. And when we respond in wonder and exaltation, we are rightly responding to our belief that Jesus is the Son of God. That what the angel told Mary in verse 37, for nothing is impossible with God. No matter what situation or circumstance we find ourselves in, Jesus can bring peace in the midst of the storm. It doesn't mean that the storm is going to stop raging. And I'm not talking about health and wealth. If you believe it, it will come. It is this, even in the craziest of situations, you can have peace. I've experienced it in my own life. I chased peace in my situations forever. And eventually I got to the place where I gave up myself and submitted to him. When he said, are you ready to me? I said, yes. And I had this peace that I shouldn't have had because my world was falling apart and it was mostly self-induced. But somehow I knew God was going to use all that evil that I did and was happening around me for my good and the good of those around me. I would not be standing here today if I had not said, yes, I'm ready. I submit. But don't hear me wrong. There's still days that I'm stubborn and I'm a cynic and I struggle with seeing wonder and exalting God for who he is. And in those days, my peace is, seems gone. But when I eventually get my head out of looking through the windows of cynicism and stubbornness and start looking through the window of wonder, my, my circumstances may not change, but my outlook does. that peace that I'm so desperately trying to get in my situation in a person named Jesus. As we're going through Advent, you can have that peace. I don't know what you're going through right now. I'm sure the storm may be raging, but are you looking for the situation to bring you peace when only Jesus gives you real lasting peace that you can have even in the strongest of storms. He's good. While not everything may be good that comes our way, God has proven himself again and again through the scriptures and again and again through people's lives that follow him that he can even take the most horrible thing that you could imagine and make it for your good. It's what he did on the cross. The most brutal death imaginable my man, which was to be a symbol by the Romans to the world around them that don't do what he did, you're going to end up here. And Jesus took it on. And he ended up ruling the world. See, we live in the already but not yet. Jesus inaugurated his kingdom and he has not fully actualized it. One day he will come back again. The new heavens and the new earth and he will finally put to full death sin 
and death and everything that's bad and all things will be made right that were supposed to be before Adam and Eve walked the other way in stubbornness and cynicism. But if you're a follower of Jesus, you are already a citizen of that kingdom, living as an exile here in this world. Your home is eternal. And Jesus says, I bring you peace. Not as the world gives, but as the Father gives me, I give to you. We're all looking for that peace. Jesus is the only one that freely gives it. When we're full of wonder and exaltation, it helps us to know the Prince of Peace and know that peace that he gives. Well, holy God, we come to you and exalt you and come in awe and wonder of what you did so many years ago when you sent your son to earth to be born of a virgin, to not only live the life we couldn't, die on the cross for our stubbornness and cynicism and sin, And then not only that, but rise again, that those who would call on his name, that believe in him and follow him, would have the Holy Spirit living and dwelling in them to have new and redeemed lives. Fully knowing that we still battle the old self. The one that tends to go through cynicism and stubbornness. But help us to have wonder in our eyes and exaltation in our hearts so we can know that peace that passes all understanding. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, thanks for joining us again today. And I pray that this message was encouraging to you. We live in a day and age where stress and anxiety are running high and rampant. I gave a teaching to the high school and middle school students on Wednesday, and if we're looking for peace in our situations, we're never going to find it, at least for long periods of time. As this video comes out, I think a couple weeks prior, even in the happiest place on earth, Walt Disney World and Epcot, there was a family fighting. If anybody where that should be peace in our world, at least that's my happy place here, that would be a place where I would expect it. But even there, it can't give lasting peace. Only Jesus can. As we close, hear this benediction, this Advent blessing. Be people of peace. Let the peace, let peace live in your heart and share the peace of Christ with all you meet. Share peace by acting out of compassion and not fear. Share peace by listening to all sides of the story. Share peace by praying for our world. In this Advent season, we need to see, feel, and share peace. As you go out into the wonder of God's creation, share peace and hope with those you meet. Amen. I hope you have a great week, even in the midst of maybe some hard circumstances that you feel the peace of Christ. We hope to see you soon. And again, I hope you have a great week. Bye.